Okay, so good evening, everyone. I'm Maurice Carter, the president of Sustainable Newton. I want to thank you for joining us this evening for our webinar, a panel discussion on the film, The Story of Plastic. I first want to welcome with thanks our panelists for this evening. We're joined by Covington City Council member Susie Keck, by Newton County Commissioner Nancy Schultz, who also serves on the County Solid Waste Authority, so multiple perspectives that are important to this topic tonight. We are joined by, uh, from Emory University and their Zero Waste Ambassadors Program. We're joined by Rachel Bissetti and Candace Allison. Uh, Rachel was, uh, attended the uh, climate reality training that Sarah and I went to early last year along with Melissa Hage and, you know, she away from our board. And so we're really grateful that Rachel has stayed uh, accessible to us. And we're really happy to meet Allison this evening and have her join us as well. We had hoped to also have, uh, Covington native Georgia Tech graduate research engineer Carly Travis this evening. Uh, she's unfortunately under the weather, so she wasn't able to join us, but uh, we're glad for the folks that are here. And then I'm uh, joined by my fellow board member, Sarah Vincent. And Vincent and Sarah is going to be our moderator for this evening. And uh, so hopefully you all had a chance to watch the film uh, that was available to stream. If you haven't seen it, uh, the, the um, the length that we have, I think, will be done today. You might try it still and see, but I did check uh, earlier this week, and the film is also available on Amazon Prime for like $1.99. We could have saved you two bucks, but uh, it's still worth the time to watch it if you didn't get a chance. So, again, thanks for being here. Sarah, I'm going to turn it over to you and let you uh, engage with our distinguished panel. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Maurice, for setting this all up. You've become a wizard of technology and Zoom. Don't, don't jinx me now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, well, so good to see everyone. I'm looking forward to this evening's conversation. I uh, sent questions out last week, so hopefully you had time to look over those because we'll be working from those, and we'll go ahead and get started uh, with the first question, which is as follows. Um, the story of plastic highlights the enormous amount of plastic pollution that is overwhelming our oceans in many Asian countries, along with the activists who are bringing attention to the issue. Which story did you find most memorable? And Rachel, can we start with you? All right, thanks so much. Um, so there were a lot of amazing stories. Um, you know, they went in India and are talking about um, what's happening right now in a landfill, and that was probably the most memorable to me. Um, so in the Gazapur landfill, um, it's actually located right next to the dairy farm. Um, and just thinking about biomagnification and when, you know, cows are eating and they're consuming all that plastic, what's happening? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, in turn, people eat the cows, they're probably eating a little bit of that. And it just reminded me of reading an article about um, women's breast milk, how we're seeing like little um, bits of plastic being transmitted through that and other pollutants. Um, and just how crazy it is that the life expectancy there is 15 to 20 years lower just due to the landfill itself. Um, and something that I took from all the speakers that were in the um, movie was that a lot of them, like most of them were from already marginalized communities, whether that be socioeconomic or um, people of color. It was so disheartening to see that those were the ones who were sharing their stories and you know for me coming from a much more privileged setting it's not as obvious these plastic waste issues um, but to see people in Thailand who are living with this it's it really was really impactful to me. Yeah it, I mean it was striking we just we think we have litter and I've done so many litter pickups but it's nothing you know like what we saw in that story and what other parts of the world are seeing. Um, Candace. Thank you all for having me today. I'm excited to be here. Um, I think what struck me the most was, it was the woman on the boat. I believe it was in the Philippines, if I remember correctly. It was somewhere in South Asia. Um, and she was talking about how um, the West tends to be like, oh, well, you know, there's, there's a plastic pollution problem, yes, but it doesn't have to do with the plastic itself. It's a, it's a waste management issue. Um, and that just simply is not true. Um, and I think, you know, it, it was exemplified by um, the quote she said was, this waste wasn't designed to be managed. It wasn't meant to be managed. Um, it was meant to 
um, make our lives more convenient, more simple, and then ship it somewhere else and let somebody else deal with the problem. And so I think that moment is it, it exemplifies the issue of plastic waste in general is that it's something for our convenience. It's something that we don't really think about, but that um, as Rachel mentioned, already marginalized communities are then having to deal with our waste problem. Yeah, it's very true. Uh, Susie, what was your, and welcome Amina, I see you. <laughs> Glad you could join us. We're on the first question, so. I'll call okay, the, I think that all the stories really just were just shocking to me, I'll say that. Because I, you know, I, I haven't really been able to see what's going on in, you know, those areas. But I think the story that, um, the first story was the one that I think hit closest to me as a grandmother of six, soon to be seven grandchildren, uh, Tia Mafira, whatever her name was, the corporate attorney who left her practice to get involved and, uh, you know, she said she used to walk pristine beaches in Indonesia that are now covered with litter. And her own daughter, who was, you know, a young girl, will never see those pristine beaches. So that has happened so recently that it's just scary to think, what will my grandchildren see? Yeah, I, that struck me too, that a lot of the children in the film that you think they're growing up with this. This is the environment they know. They don't know the pristine beach, um, you know, or a path just on land that's not covered in plastic. Nancy? Sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. Um, well, I think that we all agree that all the stories were pretty powerful. I think what I'm left with from the, from the overall stories is just this visual of that those mounds of plastic that are in the waterways mm -hmm. and i you know i remember them pulling the bird out with the plastic all intertwined in the bird and i just you know I, the visual of not being able to you know when i can't remember which um which story it was but when they were walking through the the, the river and it was you know you couldn't see the sides of the the riverbanks and that plastic is um polluting their water i mean it's just you know which is a basic and so i just i think that i know for us on the solid waste authority mm -hmm. You know, we've been wrestling with this because we know that China, you know, everybody was sending their waste to China and to those Asian countries and they're not taking it anymore. And good for them because they've got to clean up what we saw in that film and it's just massive. Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, I, I don't know that any one story stood out to me. It was the culmination of how, all of that waste was impacting their water systems. Mm -hmm. And, it, you know, with you talking about our solid waste authority, it really drives home the point that it's a global issue. It's not, oh, those countries, you know, like, um, I think, Rachel, you had mentioned that, you know, it's not their waste problem. It's, it's the global problem that we're all connected by this. Amina, um, what, what story or activist was memorable for you in the film? I agree with uh, Miss Nancy. All of the stories were kind of not crazy because I knew it was happening, but seeing it was just mind blowing. Seeing the massive scale of how far plastic pollution has spread was just uh, not an eye opener because we are aware of it, but just seeing it really was just like, wow. This is a very, very big issue. And especially from someone who comes from the islands, seeing um, uh, when they were talking about the ocean and the amount of plastic waste that's in the ocean. And then it got me thinking back to when they were drilling it into our heads about how important the ocean is and why we need to keep it clean. And as a child, you're thinking, yeah, of course, we got to keep the ocean clean. Why would it be dirty? And now growing up and seeing that, like, like 
all of it is covered in like uh, the little uh, uh, plastic ba uh, balls that you make bigger things out of and bottles and everything. I go back to my childhood. I'm like, I, I want my little sister to experience this. She's 12 now, but like I want my grandchildren and future generations to experience the clean ocean and the animals that I got to, I got to swim with dolphins and go snorkeling and see the beautiful reefs and like to mm -hmm. see that it's dying and that it's being hurt because of uh, larger companies, plants and so forth. It's, it's hurtful, it was hurtful. So that's what I took away from it, but that's things that you already knew. It also impacted me because seeing the marginalized communities uh, that were hurting because of our waste was just like, we have a responsibility, not just to us and not to just our future generations and American children. We have a responsibility for everywhere globally. And uh, another thing that hit me was the power plants. When they were talking about, this woman was talking about how uh, it was like a huge percentage chance that the children would um, grow up to have leukemia and cancers and the plant was still there. That to me just seems like pure evil because you can connect the dots. It's not like we don't know what's causing it. It's the plant and these people live right next to it and it's dangerous. If there's an explosion that wipes out so many innocent lives and it just mm -hmm. really puts it in perspective about how much big companies do not care about the people that are paying taxpayers money to keep them there. So it was just, it was crazy for me to watch it, but very eye-opening. Yeah, I think we can all agree it was eye-opening, it was overwhelming, it's a big problem, it's a global problem, we're all connected. Um, so the next question is, between the stories, the film presents a timeline and facts about our plastic history. What was new information for you so we had that visual you know what we saw was new but what were some of the facts that were presented that were new to you and then what do you think people need to be most aware of what facts and we'll start with Susie um I think the fact that impacted me was how recent all this waste has piled up. You know, the invention of plastic, I was in carpet sales for, you know, 40 years and the carpet industry basically is much like the plastic industry, a, a terrible pollutant. And uh, they also, you know, will tell you they're recycling, but in fact, they're not recycling more than 3% of what they produce. So the, the marketing, you know, is mythical. So mm -hmm. this, this kind of program, when you see where we started with Tupperware, it was like the greatest invention there was, but it wasn't that many years ago. And here we are today. And the facts are that Tupperware, the best product on earth and Pampers today is our, one of our worst problems on earth. And how are we going to solve it? Right. Yeah. They're products that we've become dependent on you know that um that makes it more challenging yeah and i think i think the question you know that that comes when you see this timeline is which which keeps hitting me is why are we using plastic mm -hmm. we don't have an alternative right now right i mean we have some alternatives but if we've done this much damage in 10 to 15 years What's going to happen in the next 10 to 15 years? Yeah, I think it, one of the facts was that within the last, the half of the plastic has been produced in the last 15 years. That's, right. that's scary. Yeah. You just think about how much more plastic people are using today than they, they were, you know, even our detergent. Instead of coming in a, a bin today, you get the refillable, you know, that you put in the bin or you throw the bin away. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Candace. So I think what was most um, new to me was the issues with incinerating the plastic, right? Um, I, I had known that that plastic was, was burned um, and some, sometimes, but I didn't realize like on what a large scale it's being burned on. Like there are whole plants 
whose whole job is to just take plastic and burn it, take plastic and burn it. And then all of that, um, all those greenhouse gases are then being released into the air, which has um, an effect on air pollution and air quality, the ozone layer. Um, and that has an effect on people's health too, right? Like that's, it's not even just a, a, a waste problem. It, it becomes a, a human health and a public health problem. Um, in terms of what I think people should be most aware of, I appreciated how the film was very um, intentional about holding the companies that produced the plastic accountable. Um, I, you know, I, I in general think that, um, <laughs> you know, recycling and, and being more eco-friendly has definitely been like an individual responsibility. That's how it's been um, taught, at least to me growing up. It was, you know, I was told like, you need to make sure that you're recycling and that you're being good to the earth. And then it's kind of, um, you know, it's almost like a double standard that I have to be good to the earth and that the waste that I create, I'm responsible for, but the waste that these um, large companies create they're not responsible for that. Uh, it's being pushed onto me. Um, so I think that was probably the, the biggest takeaway for me and that I think other people should take with them. And we've really carried that as consumers, we've carried that burden and we're trying to use our reusable bags and, you know. That's and people make it hard too, right? Like if you're um, someone who is lower income or who lives in a rural area who doesn't necessarily have access to like a bulk shop, or a shop that has, um, you know, things where you can refill things or shampoo bars or things that don't come in plastic. It's really hard, right? Because you go to the store and all your options for shampoo, for example, are all in plastic, all of them. And so it's, you know, it's, it's hard to, to make better choices if you don't have the privilege to make those choices. Yeah, and if you live in an area, I think like Newton County, I don't, you know, if you live in Atlanta, a big city, you're going to have Athens, maybe even, um, we just don't have those options. Amina, what were the, the facts that really hit you about plastic? And I cannot remember the exact place where it was said. I think it was in India, but when they were talking about how they used to go to large fresh markets and they would bring glass and reusable items that they could use to get their soy sauce, to get their vegetables, to carry back to their homes. And then with the introduction of American consumerism and Western plastic and all of that, it changed everything. And that blew me away because I was just like, these people were doing fine. Like mm -hmm. we did not need to introduce this. And we did it because of financial gain. And that it just, it shows you how much we don't, not we, as in, in here, but collectively as a people, when we think about uh, how Americans are very large consumers, we think that, oh yeah, this is how it should be. When our way of living life clearly is not the way that we should be living if we want to be environmentally uh, safe for our future generations. So that, that fact that our Western ways and our Western ideals that, oh yeah, plastic this, plastic that, literally is destroying a very strong part of their culture, which is uh, eating fresh, like every day, uh, eating straight from what they've grown and to going to grocery stores and markets and getting plastic and then the plastic ending up in their water and everywhere. So th that fact really blew me away. And to add on to what Candace said about how it's difficult to not use plastic, as a person who's just moved in and who's I, I would like to like stop using it, it is so hard. Just today we had to go to the store and go get groceries and you know you want to get your fresh produce, but it's expensive. And when I'm thinking about it like as a person because I'm as blessed as I am now to have the things that I do have, back then when I was younger, we didn't have the money to get the fancy, you know, fresh produce, all this. We had to go for the plastic stuff because that is all that we could afford. So now as a kid, when you're telling me, oh, you can't use plastic anymore. Well, what am I going to eat? You know, I can't just not use plastic because there were no other alternative. So the fact that uh, we, with Western uh, ideals and ways going into other countries and I would just say completely ruining, but messing a lot of stuff up there, that fact really hit me the hardest. And I think that should be 
talk to other people just to say like your way of living because there is a there's a xenophobia in the american culture there's a lot of it that your way of living does not mean that you are correct 100 percent of the time and that's okay because as people globally around the world we have to learn from each other and how we can benefit each other it's not supposed to be a war we're not supposed to be building walls or being oh my western way is better than your southern ways. it doesn't matter it's what's better for us as human beings and what's going to get the next generation the best view of the earth that we've been doing for so long. So that's what it is. That's a good point, yes. Seeing other perspectives. Rachel. Yeah, so um, one of my biggest takeaways from like the facts they were sharing um, was when they were talking about China no longer taking our plastic and talking about well, what exactly were we recycling in the first place and how they talk about only 14% of plastic can actually be recycled. And from that 14%, 2% of it can be effectively recycled, meaning that it can be used in the same level of capacity that it was before. So it's just as durable, just as malleable, um, just as good. And that was something that I thought was really interesting because about a month ago, um, NPR released this piece about how oil companies had tricked us into recycling by putting that you know, a little triangle on everything, even though it's not really recyclable. And it, it's, I think there's such a disconnect between what can be recycled and what should be recycled and what is recycled. You know, I have all these memories as a child of every Sunday, my dad and I and my siblings, we would go, we would go to the recycling center, we would drop everything off. And that was like something that I grew up with was just recycling and like looking back now and even as they were talking about like these brand audits in the video, of, like going through and seeing mm -hmm. what plastic you're using that's not actually being recycled. And it's just fascinating to me because you really can target, you really see that these are so few companies like Nestle, Coca-Cola, P&G, we're seeing that it's these same people over and over who are tricking us into thinking that, yeah, you're recycling, you're doing great. You can buy it again because we're taking care of it. And it's not, and it's, I thought it was so fascinating that it's not even, even though they're the ones putting the stamp on it saying it is recyclable, it's not them recycling it, which makes sense. But it's something that I never thought of before that like all these companies, these packaging companies in order to avoid criticism were the ones who were saying, hey, taxpayers, you have to fund your own recycling systems, mm -hmm. um, which I don't know, putting that connection together just blew my mind. And I was like, they really have us so tricked like we're so fooled by them um so i just think like the public needs to be more aware of you know saying what's recyclable versus what is recycled and i think that's what needs to be um told more often it's a real challenge i don't know if this was in the film or if if i read it but i think it's become so expensive like 80 it costs 80 percent more was that in the film to make something out of recycled material than it does to make something new. So, it, you know, who is going to be making some using, who is going to be recycling and using those materials? I don't know. Nancy. So, you know, we've been wrestling with this on the Solid Waste Authority for a long time. And um, that triangle and the whole, um, the marketing is from our, um, uh, clean and beautiful is to reduce, reuse, and recycle. So there are three components. And I think when you watch the film, suddenly the reduce becomes really much more powerful mm -hmm. um, because it we've conditioned everybody to believe in recycling, but that's really not what we need to be doing. Yes, there are some things like cardboard that we need to recycle, but when it's plastic, you know, reduce that or maybe have a one plastic container that you refill. Mm -hmm. And I think this film really illustrated that, uh, drove home that point. But the one thing that I have to say that I learned, um, and it was kind of, it was not real, um, it, it was kind of a, a nugget, I guess, I had watched the debate the night before I watched this film. And so they were all talking about fracking and the Green New Deal. And frankly, I'm going to be honest. I, you know, I know the term fracking, 
but I really didn't understand the connection of fracking to plastics. Mm -hmm. And I, and that was a real eye opener to me that I really need to understand that concept better because yeah, you know, and I don't want to get political here, but mm -hmm. do, what is, what is the end result in these countries that are substantially gaining their fuel through fracking and how is that connected to this plastic explosion i mean they need they need fuel to heat their homes and and, and they have to have that some way so you know it's a vicious cycle but that was the con that was a connection i had never made before right well and it seemed like so much of the fracking that they there was going to be a reduction or there is going to be a reduction in demand for that with renewables coming on. And so they need another system to feed into. And so it's the plastic. So it's exporting the natural yeah. gas. Yeah. And it's a vicious cycle. Yeah. Yeah. Cause they're, they want to produce it. That's something they can produce. That's good. Okay. Well, so now we'll move on to kind of more your, um, your personal experiences and cause you all have such, interesting connections to plastic. Um, what aspects of the story of plastics from production to waste have you encountered and addressed through your various roles as consumers, students, business people, and government officials? And Amina, we'll let you go first. So I will go out and say, I'm one of the people that do use plastic <laughs> normally and on a daily basis. And it's very difficult to not use plastic. And in Bermuda, it was different. Like when you go to Bermuda and you see, like you ask for a plastic plate, they're gonna be like, I mean, yeah, but why don't you use a regular one? It was just, it's like weird. Why are you asking me for a plastic plate? And it's about laziness and it's about how they were raised and when you're in Bermuda, the, you live off the land. Everything that you have, yes, it's some of it's exported or imported in, but most of it is from your local farms. So there's not going to be any plastic pollution. If you litter, you will be fined. Like, they do not play about that. When I moved to Bermuda, I mean, to America, the entire mindset about the earth change. I just saw people throwing Coca-Cola bottles everywhere, children be in the hallway just throwing lots. Mm -hmm. I might have lost her for a moment there. Okay, it's not just me that, that yeah. She broke up. <laughs> okay, well, um, well, don't care. Ask, you're not going to want to change yes. it. You're not going to want to change it. It all starts in here and with the children and with the adults that have power. Because you're, you're telling me, oh, you have to save the earth. Well, I don't care about it. I mean, it's not my problem, right? Make it their problem. And the only way to make it other people's problems that won't listen to you is to go for what... Okay. I don't know if Amina's still talking, but we, I can't hear her. So why would I change? It's breaking up a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Amina, you're breaking up. So I'm going to um, just move to someone else, but hopefully your connection will improve. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Um, Rachel, how about for you? Because this is an opportunity to talk to, about your role as a zero waste ambassador, I hope. Yeah, um, sure. So um, my sophomore year of college, I actually interned with Clean Water Action, um, which is a nonprofit, and I worked in the New Jersey office, and we did a Rethink Disposable campaign. Um, so I would go around canvassing, cold knocking people's doors, um, talking to them about the plastic problem, and, you know, why they should push New Jersey legislator um, to make a change. Um, fast forward, last month, they actually approved the New Jersey plastic ban bill, um, so that was super exciting, um, and, like, Way to go, New Jersey. I'm very proud of you. <laughs> um, but like one of the biggest frustrations I had with talking to people was just them being like, what am I supposed to do? Like, I can't drink the water here because it's polluted. So I have to buy like Nestle branded water bottles. And they weren't seeing that connection between the companies who are the ones polluting the water and the ones who are giving them that problem solving solution. Um, so, 
that was something that I found so frustrating. Um, and I know Mina kind of touched on it as well, that people were like, well, why should I have to change my lifestyle if there's no reason, like no incentive for me to do it? And it was just kind of encouraging people that to understand that it's not mutually exclusive to understand that larger corporations are responsible for the crisis, but also wanting to make changes in your own life. Um, so that's something that I really want to stress. Um, and, you know, fast forward a little bit, as a junior at Emory, um, I got the opportunity to serve as a waste intern with OSI or the Office of Sustainability Initiatives, um, where I'm the current waste ambassador, zero waste ambassador head for the second year now. Um, and Candace is one of our amazing zero waste ambassadors here with us. Um, and what we do is we really try and push for Emory's sustainability goals. So we have a zero uh, landfill waste goal for 2025, which means we're going to try and divert 95% of our waste away from landfills, whether that be composting or recycling. Um, but something that we do for outreach is we're really trying to focus on, um, like Miss Nancy said, that reduce and that reuse. We don't want to have to recycle because like we saw in this video, it's not practical. We're not going to recycle our way out of this crisis. Um, something that we have, we believe in is just honest education to people. So we do a lot of outreach, um, whether that's with older citizens who are trying to understand what to do with their plastic now, because it's changing so rapidly. This is nothing that they grew up with, um, but also talking to younger people about, you know, why this problem exists and what they can do about it and practicing at home activism to try and get corporations to care about it. Um, so we're really lucky to have this kind of group at Emory, um, but that doesn't mean we don't have frustrations on campus as well. You know, especially as we're seeing with the coronavirus pandemic, there are so many reusables right now, or um, sorry, disposables right now. Um, we really have to push for those reusables. Um, so I think that this video was amazing because it touched on so many different aspects of issues that we're seeing with plastic solution, whether that be on the front end of, you know, with fracking and how water is being polluted or, you know, at the final stage when we're just seeing like actual Coke bottles float down the river. Um, so those are all things that I've seen, um, but I do think we have people who are making, you know, great progress. Like we saw in New Jersey, that grassroots effort um, was something that was so successful. It took about a year, but we got there, you know, zero waste. Yeah, what, what is that, that dam that, that's been put in New Jersey? Yeah, so in New Jersey, um, last month, I think September 25th or 24th, mm -hmm. um, New Jersey approved a statewide ban on single-use plastics and styrofoam. Um, just like New York, but a little bit more progressive. Um, so New York, Vermont, and New Jersey, I think, are the states in the Northeast right now who have those bans. Um, wow. People watching, I'm from the Northeast, not from Georgia. <laughs> um, so that's a little bit of my background. But yeah, we are seeing that, you know, what we're doing is working. It's not working as quickly as we want it to be. But I think it's important people understand that, yes, it's businesses are the issues, but individuals can be the solution, especially when we band together. That's great to hear. And Candace, do you want to chime in since you're a fellow ambassador? Of course, I'd love to. Um, I think Rachel made a really great point about, you know, even though we were not the ones who created this problem, we can be the solution. Um, and the reality of it is, too, I don't think big business is going to care about the plastic problem until they start losing money and until people stop refusing to buy their products. Um, so some of the things that I've done in my life um, to reduce uh, my plastic consumption. Well, first I want to say is that it is overwhelming. When I first decided I was like, okay, I'm going to go low waste. I'm going to like get rid of the plastic in my life. It, I looked around and I was like, everything I own is in plastic. My toothbrush is plastic. Uh, my toothpaste is plastic. Uh, my shampoo, all my stuff in my kitchen, like ev everything is plastic. So what I did was I did things one thing at a time. Um, and that's really, I think the best way to do it. So I started off like getting a reusable water bottle and that was my goal. I was like, okay, one month, I'm gonna get this. And then next, you know, you get um, you know, a reusable shopping bag to go to the store with and you get reusable produce bags. And there's just things that you can do to slowly reduce your waste. Um, also, being a, Z, a ZWA has been um, a really great way for me to um, do my part for this plastic problem. So, um, you know, and it's 100% free. Like, I get to 
you know, it doesn't cost me anything and I get to hang out with um, awesome people like you guys and do awesome panels like this. And um, also consuming less is the, the best way to go about it. Like Miss Nancy said, like reduce is the first thing that you should do. <laughs> um, so stop, you know, it, and it's hard too. I think in Western culture is very consumer. It's always like, I'm going to get the next iPhone. I'm going to get the next, you know, uh, whatever's in style for this fall that wasn't in style last fall that I have to have for some reason. Um, consuming less, I think, is a really um, powerful way to to go about it. Um, and then there's also things that are free, like voting. I'm going to do a little plug for the election here. Um, vote, mm -hmm. because you are going to vote people in who either care about the plastic problem or who don't care about the plastic problem. And your vote directly tells, even if your candidate doesn't win, it tells the candidate that did win, like, wow, a lot of people voted for this candidate, or a lot of people emailed me talking about um, how they're concerned about plastic pollution. And that is how we can make real systemic change is by voting in individuals who care about the environment and who care about reducing, um, you know, the plastic waste that, that we produce. Thank you. Nancy. Well, I've been making a list here so I can make sure I cover all the bases. So um, I think you all know that I uh, own, my husband and I own and manage the Oaks Golf Course. And I guess it was three, three or four years ago, we made a decision that we were going to change our, um, uh, our plastics to compostables. So we don't have any styrofoam. We changed everything to compostables. But then along comes COVID and we were using, um, you know, we, we had dishes and silverware and now we have to backtrack and have disposable silverware because they don't, the, our, our providers don't provide compostable forks and spoons. So we, you know, we had made great progress. I'd gotten my entire staff to buy in. I mean, even our, 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 we, our um, disposable glass uh, cups are compostable. So they're not plastic, plastic, they're compostable type plastic. So we'd made that decision and we uh, conditioned everyone and then along comes COVID and we have to take we took two steps forward now to take another step backwards. So, but you know, we all, clearly we want to protect the public. So we'll get back to that eventually. Mm -hmm. um, I want to, as Maurice said, when he introduced me, I've been on the solid waste authority since um, 2016. And um, we did a, a strategic plan for the solid waste authority and one of our objective, one of our strategic action items was to um, adopt a zero waste policy. And we looked at um, other states and South Carolina has a statewide zero waste policy so that they actually have goals. So each community can, if you attain those goals, you, you know, there's grants available. Well, mm -hmm. Georgia doesn't have that. And so it was a real foreign concept to people, even on the Solid Waste Authority, to adopt these zero waste goals. And I would have to say that it's still a work in progress to get them to understand that, you know, we don't need to go backwards and open more recycling centers. We need to move forward with our zero waste objectives. Now, I stepped in a pretty big hole one day because while we were in these discussions on, um, on our strategic plan, I said, well, my kids live in California and you can't have a plastic bag. And every time I go to California, I have to take my bags with me to go to the grocery store. It just so happens our chair of the Solid Waste Authority works for a local company that makes plastic packaging. And so he took a, he took note and said, you can't, you can't set goals like that in this county because you're going to interfere with the economic development of our community and some of our manufacturers. And I thought, ooh. So how do we get that manufacturer on board to look at how they 
you know, they, we certainly don't want them to go out of business. I mean, that's a main, a major source of revenue for the county and for jobs. But how do we work with that manufacturer to where they're a responsible, they're providing responsible packaging? I haven't figured that out yet. So we'll, maybe that's something that we as a group can work on. Um, yeah. Our next question will address that a little bit, but yeah, maybe we can continue. And um, I will say also that um, over the past two weeks, my daughter came home for a visit. And like I say, she's from California or she lives in California. Mm -hmm. And um, so her goal was to get me to streamline all of my stuff in my house. So we've been going through all my through 40 years of stuff, mm -hmm. 50 years of stuff. And so, I, you know, I have a real penchant that I'm not going to put it in the landfill. That, you know, I'm on a solid waste authority. I'm not going to put that stuff in the landfill. So we're trying to figure out, okay, so what do we do with it? And we have found several consignment shops. And so I feel like that's a good way to recycle or reuse the products and reuse it for someone, you know, obviously give to goodwill, but a lot of times goodwill just throws it in the landfill yeah. and so if you take it to a consignment shop you have some accountability that it's not going directly into a landfill and then not replacing it right away but only replacing items that are really necessary so those are my personal experiences yeah that, well this has definitely been a good COVID has been a good time to kind of declutter, rethink our spaces. <laughs> so Susie. Well, I'm, I'm just gonna go through what I wrote down here. Um, I, I'm blessed that I was able to retire uh, six years ago, but I spent 40 years in the commercial carpet business. Uh, I worked as a dealer salesperson who installed it. And whenever we installed new carpet in someone's home, we pulled up old carpet. Mm -hmm. I worked in the manufacturers. And so I, I touched, you know, every, every point of carpet in a 40 year career. And uh, at one point we could pull up the old carpet out of your house and take it somewhere. And it was being recycled. And uh, then all of a sudden all those facilities closed because they couldn't make any money. So all that carpet, and all the carpet still is either going into the landfill where your great great grandchildren will visit it or it's being incinerated, which, you know, that's another story. But along my career, they started doing recycling, you know, what we thought was recycling, you know, it was a marketing tool. I could go in and compete against another manufacturer and tell this great story about how we were taking plastic bottles and putting it into our um, backing or how we were burning the old carpet and then taking the coal ash and putting it into our backing. And by the year 2020, now this was in the mid nineties, mm -hmm. and by the year 2020, we'll have zero waste. It hadn't happened. It's nowhere close to happening. But the story's being, still being told when a salesperson talks to an architect, designer, or a consumer. So it's, it's a little frustrating on this end of my career. I can look back and say, yeah, they are doing something, but it's nowhere near enough. Um, as a consumer, uh, my grandchildren are such educators. Uh, we went to a restaurant recently and my, and the waitress came up and gave everybody a straw and my nine-year-old grandson was horrified. He took them all off the table and handed them back and said, these go in turtles' noses. I didn't know that, but I saw that in your film. And uh, so my grandchildren are so much more aware and I'm trying to be more aware. You know, my, my cup today, you know, is a reusable cup. Uh, I've gotten the city to give everybody in the city a cup, you know, and ask them not to use plastic bottles. And, uh, you know, we have to reuse, reuse, reduce, reduce. And I think that that word has just got to get out there. Um, and it's easy to get it out to school children and hopefully the school children will tell their parents and it, and it goes on and on and that, that'll help. 
but uh, it's not big enough. Now on a government level, working you know, for a municipality, um, what can I do? Um, I'm, I'm involved in some exciting opportunities that we're looking at at ways to reduce waste. And uh, you know, we're, we're actually going on a field trip to look at something someone else is doing. And they know that's a passion I have. So, you know, I'm trying to always bring it to the forefront when we're talking about things. You know, on the sanitation level, the town got so mad when we outsourced sanitation. And, uh, you know, it started a few years ago when we quit recycling glass. They were furious. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm paying my taxes. You need to recycle glass. Well, there's nobody that wants the glass. <laughs> and when you had the opportunity to tell somebody one-on-one, -on -one, they understood it. But, you know, everybody just want to bad mouth, you know, wants to bad mouth the government. We're taking their money and not doing anything with it. So I have to look at ways to reduce those things from a government standpoint and better ways to do something with those things from a government standpoint. And education, in this film alone, I mean, I don't know how we get it out to everybody. But, you know, it needs to go out to everybody. Am I able to share the link? You know, you can actually go to um, sto the Story of Plastic and you can sign up for your own screening. And then they would send you a link that you'll be able to share. So you, this can go on. They want to get the word out. So like Marie oh. said, the film is on a, now on Netflix, but you can do a group screening and it's free yeah so, that, that, that's awesome to know I, I mean I would love to, to do something like that and then on a you know what can I else can I do um Nancy and I've discussed this before and I've and we have the same issue I'd like to ban plastic bags mm -hmm. to me that is so simple I, I would like to ban uh use of uh plastics and styrofoam in the restaurants you know, I think that as a city that we can write an ordinance and say, but the COVID's an exception. But what, what you were doing at the Oaks, there's no reason everybody can't do that. And sure, it's not going to make the, you know, it's not going to save India, but it might save an island. And there's just things everybody's got to think about. What little things that add up and add up. It's like a snowball. You know, what can we, what can we do that'll add up? And reuse and reduce is our best start. And I know if the, our fellow Sustainable Newton board member was here, Theodosia, Theodosia Wade was here, she would be saying refuse. That, that, that's the new word, refuse. Oh, refuse, yeah. Reuse and recycle. So. Yeah, well, you know, don't, the audience, so. <laughs> don't get the plastic utensils. You know, when you get takeout food, Right. Don't accept those plastic utensils. I mean, I do that already, and I don't like to eat off a plastic utensil, and that was before I was concerned about plastic. But, uh, you know, there's, there's things individuals can do that will add up, but ultimately, somehow, we've got to hold the big Coca-Cola, Dow Chemicals. It's got to start there, just like Europe. You know, we, we need to say, no. You can't do it. Figure it out. Yeah, and this leads us to the, the next question, which we've really touched on. But, um, you know, the film makes clear that we can't recycle our way out of the plastic waste problem. And how do you envision a future without single-use plastics? What policies and systems are needed to help us get there? And so we've touched on that, but maybe we can dive a little, little deeper. Um, Susie, do you want to, you would, talking about Europe and some of the things there. Right. I've, I've been lucky to do a lot of traveling in Europe. And uh, it's just second nature there. And, and at Emory, it's becoming second nature. Because if it's not available, you don't use it. So the refuse, I love that. You know, I'm going to add that to my reuse. You know, I love, love refuse. And, you know, we've got to refuse to buy it. Because the only thing that is going to affect these companies is the pocket. And, you know, young, young designers that are selecting materials, they're paying attention. What will happen? What is the life cycle of this product? And what will happen at the end of its life? And then if you don't have a good answer, they're going to choose another product. So why can't we do that as everyday consumers? What's going to happen to this product at the end of its life? What is its life cycle? And, uh, 
What can we do? I think the way Europe taxes them mm -hmm. so that they have money to do something with the waste at the end of its life is, is what we have to do. I, I agree. Um, Candace. I, mean, I think Ms. Susan hit the nail right on the head. Um, you know, in places where there is like, for example, a plastic bag tax, it's an extra five cents or what have you on your grocery bill when you go and use a plastic bag. I mean, that incentivizes people to not use them. Um, these companies care about making money. They don't care about you and they don't care about the environment. They care about putting money in their pocket. And the only way to get through to them is to say, until you take action and take responsibility for the waste that you create, I am not going to buy your products. Not, I mean, that's, that's, you know, that's it. One thing that I think stood out for me in the film about, you know, when we're talking about like systemic um, problems is that recycling is possible because of poverty. Poverty is the reason that recycling exists because we send our waste to people who are impoverished, to people who are um, people of color, to people who live in middle and low income nations. That's the reason we can recycle is because, you know, we can just throw it either in the landfill or we can throw it in the recycling bin and let somebody else deal with the ramifications of our actions. Um, so I think we need radical legislation banning single-use plastic. I think in an ideal world, I would say no, no single-use plastic of any kind. Um, of course, you know, there are people who, for example, may need straws for medical reasons, which is, you know, totally fine, but banning single-use plastic. For example, um, Greenpeace is working on um, a campaign right now to get uh, Coca-Cola to stop producing single-use plastic. Coke used to come in glass bottles. Um, hasn't in my lifetime, but it used to. <laughs> so, um, you know, we already have things that worked, right? But Coke and glass is perfectly fine. And, you know, there's no reason that we can't do that now. But Coke is like, oh, well, people, people want their Coke and plastic. So what Greenpeace is doing is they're saying, there's a petition of all the people who absolutely do not want their Coke and plastic. So, you know, grassroots organizing can be really effective as well. And I think that another way to, to, to kind of tackle this problem is to invest in aluminum and glass as packaging. Mm -hmm. Aluminum is actually one of the few materials, I believe it's the only material actually, that it's cheaper to recycle aluminum than it is to create new aluminum. Mm -hmm. So that makes it very, um, lucrative to companies that use aluminum because they can actually save money by using recycled aluminum. Glass is also a really great option. It's a bit more expensive, but glass can be infinitely recycled. You don't have to worry about effectively recycling glass, like how plastic can only really be downcycled. That's mm -hmm. not the case with glass. Glass can keep being recycled and recycled and recycled until, you know, the end of time. <laughs> um, so that is something that I think is really important. And then we need to invest in um, composting and renewable energy, things that don't stay on this earth, what is effectively forever. Um, so I think Emory has done a, a really impressive job. Um, when I was on campus, back when, back when that was a, a thing that we were doing, um, I would go to you know, the cafe at Rollins and get food in a completely paper um, container. So when I was done with it, I could throw it in the compost. And then we also had compostable um, like utensils. So you could just throw them in the compost and they would go and get um, composted. It was completely, completely plastic free. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that is the kind of radical change that we need that Emory is modeling um, to, you know, at least, <laughs> What they said in the in the film was turn off the tap right the bathtub's overflowing the first thing that we need to do is turn off the tap and stop the problem where it is and then we can start bailing bailing the water out right and it can be a money making opportunity for other we're not saying 
shut down the economy, you know, because like you said, there's the aluminum, there's glass, there's different types of containers that are more, you know, reusable. So there are opportunities there. Nancy? So having stepped in a big hole when I made the suggestion of um, having an ordinance that banned plastic and getting my hand majorly slapped, I'm not sure that Newton County is quite ready for it. I also know that my election took a very, there was a very sizable number of people that took um, issue with my views on um, reducing and reusing instead of recycling. So I think that we have to be very, there's, to get ordinances in place, there has to be political will. And as Susie knows, you have to have a majority of people that are willing to do that. Mm -hmm. So I think that to get to that point, you have to plant several seeds and continue to water them. Now, in that process, I think that there are ways that we can plant those seeds. For example, when we have community events, Everybody gives away water bottles. Right. You know, at, there's a lot of yesterday at standing in line for um, voting. A lot of people were trying to give uh, disposable water bottles out. So, you know, maybe you, you try some uh, working with some of these events where there is some kind of incentive to um, some educational piece at those so that you're gradually changing the understanding. I know, I, I, Maurice knows this, but I do a golf and science camp and part of that golf and science camp is a whole section. I mean, we start, we give the kids um, a reusable water bottle all week. Do you know how the difficulty is to get the parents not to send a disposable bottle of water. I mean, we even have a, a cooler where they fill it up every day. We give it to them. It's theirs. We re reinforce it. We talk about um, reducing, 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 and reusing. We do all kinds of projects. But parents undermine that when they go home because it's not easy to keep it up at home. It's just, you know, we're a quick... Um, society that wants a quick fix and so we've got to do some things I, I just I, I wish I had a um, I wish I could snap my fingers and say it's not this way but it unfortunately that's been my experience so you know maybe when we have events perhaps if we can start there with, I mean, I know that Clean and Beautiful or Keep Newton Beautiful Now gives reusable bags out. And, and every time we give something, we don't give it in a plastic bag, we give it in one of the reusable bags. So that's a start. Um, as I said, my kids live in California. Every one of them carries a little kit that has a, a metal straw, a metal um, set of utensils and they carry that on the planes with them. They bring it here. They never use disposable plastic. They just keep it in their backpacks. Mm -hmm. So, you know, maybe that's something that we could look at from the county or from the city that um, we brand and give those away as, uh, as some of our branding um, so that, you know, th those are some ideas. I know that trying to get ordinances, Susie and I agree, but we're not on the same, yeah. we're not in the same uh, mm -hmm. governing body. So we got to find two other people that agree with us to get this done. And that's a tough, that is an uphill climb. So right, however we make those small steps, and have a, a grassroots effort to have uh, a sea change from the ground up, I think that's what we have to do. 
And I think on that political point, sometimes, you know, we, we focus our energy on getting the person elected that believes like we believe. And when that doesn't happen, it doesn't end there. I think part of what we have to do is say, I need to work on my friends who supported that person and get them to change their thinking. So they'll send the messages to keep supporting that person. They're going to demand something different. So I think you've got to remember that politics is also influencing the people, our fellow voters, not just influencing the candidates. So. Yeah. Well, um, I, I didn't mean to interrupt, but it probably is about time to interrupt. Did we give everybody a shot? Because we like to keep these roughly around an hour. And uh, got a couple young ladies here who may have some studying to do tonight. I don't know, but we're really appreciative that you joined us. Nancy and Susie, we're appreciative that you joined us and also for your service, for the, the things that you have done to further the kind of causes that we talked about tonight. So we've got a great, I think, generational discussion here tonight that, you know, is leaves me hopeful because of the kind of leaders that we elect and the kind of young people we have coming along to step into your shoes someday. So, Sarah, thank you so much for uh, facilitating a great discussion. Thank you to everybody who joined us in the, uh, in the Zoom meeting and on Facebook Live. Uh, we've been doing, uh, we're trying to do these things fairly regularly. Uh, it's hard for us to get together in person. We actually don't have the next event on the calendar at the moment, but we will have more. Uh, and uh, so stay tuned, follow our Sustainable Newton uh, calendar on our, our website, social media page. So, um, again, thanks, everybody, for the wonderful discussion, and uh, we'll, we'll sign off for this evening. Thank you. Oh, thank you, <laughs> thank you as well. Okay. Yeah, thanks, everybody. It was Bye. great to talk to you. We will continue the work. I think. Yes. Yeah. All right. Bye. Good night. Bye. Bye.